Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Uh, welcome to La Valle. Welcome to La Valle. Welcome to Arts Formation. Uh, my name is Christian, Christian Fiesler, and I help organize this wonderful group of uh, colleagues, the Arts Formation uh, Consortium, and um, we have an amazing program ahead of us. Um, no worries, I will not um, take too much of your time. I just wanted to say a little bit of thanks for all the amazing work that went into um, what you're about to see, the discussions and everything, and I wanted to give you a little bit of an yeah, background on why we are here gathered. So we are a number of amazing colleagues, uh, the amazing colleagues, for instance, at KEA and European Alternatives who um, organized this wonderful event. You will see them in a second. We are here today to uh, celebrate a project funded by the European Union, Arts Formation. And Arts Formation is a project about um, the question whether and how we can mobilize the arts for a more inclusive digital transformation. Um, I don't want to be like too nostalgic. It has now been three and a half, four years when we originally started with the idea of exploring whether the arts can be a valuable voice in facilitating how to think about the digital transformation. It's a bit of a rhetorical question. Of course, the arts can do that. But what you will be seeing here today and what we hope to discuss with all of you is more the question of how. So experiences of how to do that, how to engage, and also celebrate examples where people are obviously doing that, right? I mean, it's not that we um, invented everything, like my colleagues and I, but it's uh, three and a half years of uh, shining a spotlight on you know, artists and organizers around the art, curators um, that um, yeah, help us um, employ the arts to um, yeah, hopefully better think about what type of digital transformation do we want. The we now, um, just to showcase you who we are, we are today joined by amazing colleagues from um, Copenhagen Business School, so one of the partners from uh, Trinity College Dublin and our colleagues from Norwegian Business School and an amazing host of um, cultural institutions and NGOs, the colleagues from European Alternatives, pointing to the wrong direction or both directions to uh, Vach in the Netherlands, to uh, Kea here in Brussels, the colleagues from Alatra in Greece, uh, the colleagues from trying to <laughs> the, the colleagues from Liverpool, uh, Fact, uh, Transmediale in Berlin, and obviously uh, the great help of the European Union and our amazing project officers, uh, Carla, Carla Rochez Gomez, and her colleagues, um, Juliana Sicolo and Jorge Nito, Jorge Nito, which really helped us to yeah, bring us all together and keep us on track over the last three and a half years. The um, point that we want to make today is essentially to yeah, kind of like reminisce a little bit about the work that has been done. Um, what you see here is kind of like a little bit of an historical artifact when we started again four, five years ago. When in terms in terms of kind of like actually formulating that we wanted to do, we were really interested in these ideas of um, yeah, what digital transformation do we want. I think the encouraging thing is these questions are still the same, right? Kind of like what, um, what type of world are we building in a world increasingly dominated by um, artificial intelligence, algorithms? Coincidentally, right, this is kind of like all the rage, all the talk nowadays, right? Kind of like what type of world do we want to build when it now comes to foundation models and generative AI? The idea of also what type of public sphere we are building. So kind of like lots of challenges through technology, but also I think as you will also see today, hopefully lots of answers or at least a lot of prompts how to think about these challenges, right? Because um, arguably, and I'll say that a little bit off the cuff, but um, 
my, my colleague Anna and Peter wrote a wonderful piece about the nature of digital technology, right? It's on the one hand a great medicine, it makes obviously our lives better, but on the other hand, if you don't really treat it right, it might have this tendency to become a little bit toxic, right? Think about the amazing thing that social media does, think also about the toxicity that it may induce, think about the amazing things which um, artificial intelligence can do, but also think that for whatever reasons, kind of like our current discussion, at least general discussion, has become a little bit myopic, right? Kind of like when we leave these larger thoughts about what type of coexistence we want with any type of future imagined AI, why is that then suddenly dominated by large companies based in Silicon Valley somewhere, right? It's not bad that it is, but obviously we would create a better world, to use that cliche, if um, more voices would be engaging in that discussion and more voices would be heard. And that is essentially the point of arts formation and all these discussions which we're having. And that is exactly whether we can also think technology and the world that we build through technology differently, maybe more inclusively, maybe also radically different through the arts, right? Again, teaching, uh, obviously kind of like preaching here to the choir, but um, as we will also see a little bit later today, and obviously through all the work that our amazing colleagues and you have done, um, you normally tend to be stuck a little bit in your ways, right? If you just approach technology as an engineer, as a manager, as a name the profession, right? The beautiful thing about the arts, obviously, is that sometimes it can help us to help us to radically re-examine things, right? Maybe it's sometimes just refusal, which is fine. Maybe it's an alternative conception. Maybe it's constructive. Maybe it's an act of care. And all these yeah, different modes of thinking differently, thinking a bit outside of the box, and importantly, to also include others in these types of dialogues. And that is also something which we will see today and which hopefully is also reflected in our work over the years. Um, arts are obviously also a great device to bring people together, right? To include citizens which would normally not be part of these discussions, which type of technology we want to build and engage them in certainly sometimes quite complex matters, right? But make them more livable, more experienceable through the arts. We have today a number of uh, work streams here represented. No, sorry, I have to uh, admit my own bias, right? So I'm in the business school. So if you now hear work streams and everything, don't be afraid that this is kind of like this thing. No, um, we have a number of colleagues who did amazing work over the last years. And we want to showcase you today kind of like a number of these explorations. On the one hand, um, the idea what artistic perspectives in the first place are on digital transformation, so how artists navigate digital transformations, how their work is impacted by digital technology, but also how they organize themselves, how they build collectives, how they also learn to use new technologies and essentially shine a light on that and bring to the forefront what amazing work is being done. Um, we have another um, discussion and work stream over the years, which is about this idea of yeah, artists in organizations, right? Can we build on the one hand better or different or more questioning organizations through including artists? And also how do we organize that, right? These discussions of artists in residence and kind of like using artists as in, in different roles in organizations and kind of like having yeah, different ways of examining quite complex, increasingly complex through digitalization uh, topics. We um, have lots of work present um, also about the artist and the artist as a catalyst for social movements, for social transformations, and also for um, giving voice to the normally underheard. You will um, meet a number of colleagues here, for instance, my colleague Victor, um, who did together with colleagues amazing work on yeah, artistic projects who worked with underserved communities, also our colleague uh, Aris and the amazing people at Latra did a lot of work, a lot of explorations on yeah, essentially using the arts of, um, of, of essentially including an increasing democratic participation 
engagement, excitement maybe also for what might be possible if we only design and regulate and um, experiment with our digital technologies correctly, correctly in the sense of um, <laughs> arguably um, more inclusively. We um, have, um, and you will also see that a little bit later today, amazing examples of uh, colleagues bringing artists together in assemblies and residencies, much, much, much more to come. But we had the great pleasure to host quite a lot. I think Aris will talk a little bit more about that today, but quite a lot of artists to bring them together, to let them work, to share their ideas, big part of our project. We also had uh, the amazing colleagues at FACT, at Transmediale, at VAG, who um, organized, facilitated, uh, designed, uh, brainstormed a number of amazing exhibitions, workshops. We will also hear more about that. And uh, finally, we also, of course, uh, try to translate that work to policy work, so to engage with, on the one hand, in how far the arts can yeah, essentially facilitate political discussion, wishes, participation, how far that might um, gel with uh, policy making, where our amazing colleagues at um, KEA will talk a little bit more about that. With that being said, um, I think I'll leave the microphone in a second to my colleague Ségolène, and then we will go into the program proper. Just one or two formal things. Um, we are obviously um, kind of like a number of people. Some know each other already, some don't. Obviously, in the uh, spirit of uh, inclusion and participation, I think everyone is here really eager to talk to you. I would be really happy to get to know you, kind of like knowing all my colleagues, we would also be super happy to talk to you just if you see somebody standing alone or, or kind of like standing a little bit, looking a little bit lost, just talk to the people. I think everyone, it's a little bit awkward, but kind of like coming now from Norway, we know a lot about social awkwardness and kind of like how to overcome that. <laughs> Sorry for saying that. It's, I think it's absolutely fine um, if, if you approach us and talk to us. We would be really, really happy to get to know each uh, one of you and have a little bit of a discussion over the um, day here about yeah where to take the arts and to kind of also learn, of course, from your experiences with the arts and the intersection with digital technology. That having said, um, thank you so much, uh, Segolin, Billy, and everyone at the team here for hosting us. And I think I hand the microphone over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Christian. Um, first of all, welcome to you all. Um, as uh, you know, European Alternatives with KIE, uh, we've been coordinating um, this um, summit. And um, you like European Alternatives uh, is promoting equality, democracy, and culture beyond the nation state. And we want to imagine, demand, and enact um, alternatives for a viable future. And that's why for us it was so important to be within arts formation. And um, we do understand arts as an incredible medium to articulate, experiment, and build new understandings and new forms of actions. So we believe that the findings we've had all together uh, are extremely relevant today. And that from the way artists can help grasp and can play around threats and opportunities uh, from the way they have collaborated with companies and policymakers um, to unveil new ways, new approaches to the key um, topics for our futures, we can continue to learn. Um, this day has been conceived um, as um, a, a way to get valuable insight into our findings and to also experiment and experience artist-led processes of exploration of the digital transformation. So it's not just presentations, um, and each partner of the project has been curating one element of the program uh, with, uh, together with artists that had been involved uh, in the research process. And we really want to, um, the day not to just be like, from a receiving um, like experience of like receiving talks, but really a bodily exploration and experimentation of these research processes. Um, I'm just going to take you through the program briefly 
don't worry, I won't be long. Uh, so we have made efforts to propose a program that can uh, please and bridge different audio, audio, uh, type of publics as well. Um, and that's why there is um, divide between the day and the evening. Uh, but we're gonna start with the first panel um, discussing cyber spaces and how they can or cannot help develop more inclusive social practice. Um, then we'll discover the Arts Formation Smart Guide on how artistic perspectives can inform policy making. Finally, uh, during the breaks, we invite you to listen to the videos uh, at the entrance. There is a room with videos. Uh, you'll get a virtual tour of Transmediale exhibition to which Arts Formation was partners. Um, you also discover some of the, some of the artworks produced uh, within the frame of Arts Formation and um, videos of the massive online open course um, that are revealed here. Um, and in the main room there, uh, in the, uh, the break room, you also see some of the works, that, photos of, of Transmediale, and also photos of the fanzines that the artists of the residency in Lesbos um, have created. After lunch, um, Lucas Engelhardt and Karen Sinders, uh, two of the artists who have been involved in the research, are proposing workshops. Uh, for all of us to get acquainted with their artistic research in the field of digitalization and for us to uh, think and discover. At the end of the afternoon, um, we'll discover together the toolkit of, for making change in the cultural field that we're all um, expecting with great um, uh, excitement. And, um, and then we have a quick dinner, grab a sandwich, uh, and we'll continue to dig deeper in our st artistic explorations with a participative performance proposed by three of the artists of the arts formation community from the residencies, Alba Raventos, Z Summer Zugo, and Paolo Localita. And you can see already in this room, they have left uh, traces around the room. They may interrogate you already. We'll discover more tonight. And finally, in the evening, uh, we give space to one of the first artistic domain to have fully invested the power of digitalization, that is music, that helps uh, creating ephemeral, ephemeral communities of people. Um, the exploration then continues with a performance of uh, Ty and Alison, uh, who with digital tools propose us to plunge into an odyssey in utero where music, body, words, image, and voice are leading us to new horizon. We had a workshop with them uh, as the part of the research, and that's the end of their processes. Um, Sumaya Felin proposes us to bring our, atten our attention back to the outer spaciousness of earthy sound. That's a very uh, complicated sentence, but it's quite uh, exciting. And Stella Kay uh, will lead us to celebrate electronic music and its capacity to exploration. Uh, we hope that this very long day and evening will give you all a bodily and manifold first-hand experience of our research practices, the ones that have been developed by all the partners in the project and uh, which have bridged different worlds and that we hope that we we'll give good insight into um, our findings. Two small announcements. Um, well, KIE and the European Alternatives team, team are here to help you. So I'm Segolan from European Alternatives. Here is Billy, who has coordinated a lot of the day with KIE. Maybe KIE people can move, uh, wave to say hi. Uh, and um, Elisa there is the communications person. Uh, some people have said they prefer not to be photographs or videotaped videotape, that sounds really old. Uh, <laughs> um, if you haven't been uh, identified when arriving, uh, you are welcome to tell them that you don't want to, uh, and that would be good so that we don't uh, focus on you. Uh, and finally, we'd like to draw your attention to the fact that arts formation uh, is meant to be a safe space. Kristen has already uh, said that in terms of being inclusive, but also free of all forms of violence. Um, we 
we have a process at European Alternatives uh, with safeguarding policies that are quite strong. So if anyone is uh, concerned about safety, uh, or you feel that people are concerned about safety, uh, you can either speak to a member of the team or um, there is an anonymous email address you can refer to if anything happens during the evening or, yeah. Um, so, yeah, have a beautiful day. And uh, we're going to start with our first panel. Okay, thanks. So the first panel is Cyberspaces for Social Practice, Mixed Realities, Cyber Feminism, and the Digital Non-Binary. Um, so if I could invite all of my speakers to the stage. We have Maiken Overgaard, Anna Pompermeyer, and Schenk Guzelish. So, as Maiken is setting up, I'll just introduce you to her. So, Maiken is one of our board members at Arts Formation. She's also a writer, a curator, and an educational activist. And she's exploring the intersection between science, technology, and arts. And now, in this talk, she is looking at the, from the start of the World Wide Web, in the 90s to now, and how these digital spaces have affected and crafted our identity with a focus on queer identity, using examples from different artists. So. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. It's so good to see so many friends again. As Billy mentioned, I've been part of the advisory board. I'm based in Copenhagen. Uh, I used to run a center for art and technology. I did that for six years, and I, I quit uh, last year. Uh, I'm still part of the advisory board, but now I'm working as a freelance curator and writer. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to sort of speak a little bit about what I do today. I've chosen the headline, Are We All Queer? And I'll uh, get into this headline throughout the talk. So as Billy said, um, I've, I'm working with art and technology in a broad scale. Uh, the one thing that has sort of uh, been with me all along is uh, the internet, the interwebs. And uh, um, currently, I'm freelancing as a curator, and currently I'm at the National Gallery in Denmark, where we are focusing on AI, actually. As Christian said, it's very important currently. We have uh, a lot of possibilities within the art community to, to actually affect how we perceive and work with AI on a broader scale. In this project, we are looking at how to um, revive past artists that were very much forgotten. They were very big in their own time at the turn of the last century in Denmark and in the North, Nordic countries. Um, and now we are looking into how we can sort of reinterpret them into a contemporary life using uh, contemporary artists, their gaze, and, and the generative artworks. That's not really what I'm here to talk about today, but I thought it would sort of put me on the map. And I'm actually really proud of this project because it's kind of the first time I think the National Gallery in Denmark is working actively with digital art. They've had audio guides and like um, various sort of digital devices for dissemination of artworks, but they've not really dived into uh, sort of the digital in terms of the artworks that they show. But um, last year, while I was still at the center, I curated an exhibition that we named Between Realities, um, where two of the artists that I'm, I'm going to talk about today were present. And uh, throughout the project, uh, working at the advisory board, I've also been part of CBS, Copenhagen Business School, the partner in Denmark, and their practice. And they've been following a lot of the 
work that we've been doing in the center and they've included that in the MOOC that they've been doing as well. And uh, we talked a lot about this project as well. And I'm going to take you a little bit into the process of curating now because the two artists that I'm going to present to you today, I'm still working with them, even though the exhibition sort of closed off last year in November. We've been talking ever since because this was a really important exhibition for both me and them, and it sparked a lot of conversation. So it's kind of like when you work as a curator, at least that's how I work, you work with artists and then you could expect that when, once the exhibition period is over, your collaboration is over. It's, it never is. You form relations and it, and it continues. So this is sort of like where we are currently in the conversation. And um, what we came to talk about is uh, we have the internet. As I said, it's sort of like what binds my career together. And what I find funny about the current moment that we're in is that we've had the internet in almost a generation now. We can look back, we can say, okay, there was Web 1 in the 90s, then came Web 2, and now we're sort of at the border of an, maybe a, a new constellation of the internet. And I find that to be extremely interesting because in all of my upbringing, in the work that I've done, the internet has always been something new. And it still is. There are still new things happening. But the internet is now also like middle-aged, and we can look back and we can see what has this what has been, sort of been determining the internet at various points in time. And I think that's the first time that we're actually doing that is right now. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about nostalgia because I think nostalgia is kind of important in what is happening right now. We have a lot of internet nostalgia towards Web 1. A lot of people are nodding because you remember how it was in the 90s. And I do as well because that was kind of, I was in the internet. That was where I sort of... Uh, was uh, when I was growing up. Uh, but now we're transitioning from Web 2 to something we call maybe Web 3. What is it? We don't really know. No one really knows what we're going to go into. AI is going to play a role for sure. But what we've also been talking about is this idea of the metaverse. I, I mean, we all know that the word got stolen by Zuckerberg, so now we talk about something else. I like to talk about blurred interfaces, that we now have these uh, transitions between the physical space and the digital space. And um, I think when we talk about the metaverse, when we talk about these blurred interfaces, a lot of times we talk about augmented reality, virtual reality, our mobile interfaces, etc., as if the technology is somehow dominant in this transition, and I don't think it is. I think our digital identities are becoming more and more crucial for us. They mean more and more, they're becoming more and more important to us, and we have this desire to bring our digital identities into our physical life. So that's kind of like the thoughts that we were developing together, the artists and I, and um, so, when I started being on the internet in the 90s, I developed various avatars. Did you, I guess you did as well. We all have avatars. And I remember when I started, I, I used to create avatars that were somehow like me, that had the same color hair, skin color, gender, etc. And very fast that became rather boring. So I started transitioning into different types of personas. I started to play around. And as I think that most people do that, that they kind of play around with their identities when they're online. So this idea of the avatar becomes very important. So where does the concept of the avatar comes from? I got curious about that. So the word avatar is actually Hindu, and it means incarnation in human form. It was originally connected to the concept of a deity somehow becoming incarnated. And as with a lot of other things, we in the West stole that word and made it our own. And it came to mean like embodiment in a physical, in an, in an electronic medium. So this exhibition that we developed last year between realities, the avatar was somewhat important. And uh, one of the artists that were part of the exhibition 
is a Danish artist called Tit, a very young uh, uh, artist. And um, she, as well as me, and a lot of other friends grew up on the internet. And she developed a lot of different avatars. And she became so connected to her identities and her avatar, sort of the way she lived her life as the avatar, that she started to perform her avatar in the physical realm. So what you see here is uh, her using makeup and various types of sort of devices to make her avatar come real. And um, she, for, for, for Tit, the internet is somehow even more real than the physical space because when you're online, you, you have the possibility to be whoever you want. You can sort of um, instate yourself with the gender, the look, the, the, the sort of the whole persona that you want. And um, she, they have been performing that for a number of years and they use this makeup interface in various ways. Like it's not just for performative actions. This is what they look like also on a daily basis, more or less, so they can dial it up and down, of course. But uh, this is, this is what they, they like to sort of come across as, which I think is very beautiful. And we've, of course, talked a lot about what queer means for an artist as, as Tit. And she has defined it like identity, gender, and sexuality are not predetermined. So this is how they live by it. And um, it would be very sort of obvious to compare their practice to various types of performance art practices. But when we've been working with uh, her work, I've actually come to think of Robert Smithson instead. In the late 60s, he created uh, some works, some installation works that were all based on the concept of the non-site, uh, where he took various sort of earth or rocks or like natural elements from physical places around in the US and he brought it into the gallery space to sort of create a site that was non-site. And I think that Tit is creating the same. She's using her body to point to her avatar online. So she's somehow non-siting the avatar in her physical body. And um, she's, or lately they've started working in the in a in a game engine because it's about creating this transition this relationship between the digital the 3d space in this case and her physical life i'm just going to play a little bit of it um, i don't think the sound is coming across They spend uh, the, the spring in Iceland, so it's actually the Icelandic landscape that is filmed and then transferred to Unreal. And it's rather long, so I'll stop it there, but maybe we'll, we can play it in the break or something. The other artist I'd like to introduce you to is also a Danish artist called Line Finrup Jensen. And uh, they actually introduced Tit to working in a game engine. So her work is all about being present in a game engine. She is also working in Unreal. And um, 
she has this uh, concept of uh, creating these very sort of um, fun, quirky, glitchy environments. And uh, she's very inspired by glitch as defined by Legacy Russell. So what she is interested in is somehow distorting and changing the perspectives, creating these glitches in her images. Uh, she's fully able to create beautiful 3D uh, landscapes and environments, but she's choosing to do it in a different way and creating these glitchy landscapes. And when she was, I had her in a residency at the center that I was heading, and um, what we worked on there was, she start, she's always worked in 3D only, and then she started to taking stills from these game engine created landscapes and transferring them to a flat painted surface. So she went from being very digital and only working in digital environments to transferring these digital environments to the classical sort of painting uh, thing. And it, it was very odd and beautiful at the same time. And um, again, you can see she's using these glitchy uh, ways of working. And what was very interesting is she's working in this very lo-fi way and she's using a lot of nostalgia. So when, when she started creating these paintings, she's on Instagram, and she started selling the paintings on Instagram. And what was interesting was that everyone who turned up uh, at her studio to buy these paintings were all queer. Uh, and she was like, okay, what is happening here? Because it was available on Instagram. And she started striking up conversations with people who, who visited her studio. And it turned out that... Um, a lot of them associated her imagery with experiences they had in online forums when they were younger. Uh, so it was this type of imagery that they would come across or be fascinated by, or maybe just recognizing the glitch that something was a little off and they somehow felt at home in this. So. All of a sudden, Line was connecting to a, a, a very physical audience. Usually she exhibits at museums and galleries, the videos that she's doing, the installations, and all of a sudden people were purchasing her works because it was paintings. And um, it was all due to this feeling of nostalgia, and a feeling of connecting to a period in time when you were online and you were living out or trying to figure out who you were as a queer person. And uh, somehow that was coming across in the paintings and now they're present in people's homes and I just find that very beautiful. And uh, I talked to, um, to Lina as well about what constitutes queer for her and she defined it as an energy that goes against the norm and constitutes itself as an action. So even though Lena has these very cute, sort of, you saw the horses before, like very cute environments, she's also sort of has these a little bit harder uh, imageries where she's, uh, things are sharp, things are pointy. Uh, it's definitely an action uh, that she's, performing through her paintings. Um, so with both Lina and Tit, um, we've been talking a lot about this, uh, this sentence, like, are we more ourselves when we are online? And we, all three of us can sort of sign off on that, that the presence we have when we are online sometimes feel, or a lot of times feel, more real than when we're not online. And I have to stop now. Thank you, Sigla. Uh, yes, yes, but um, thank you. And uh, but we can also talk a little bit more about that because I'm actually done now. Uh, thank you, Sigla. Yeah, I'll just hand it over to to you guys. OK, 
Hey, thanks, Mikan. So now we move on to our next speakers, Anna and Jenk, um, or also known as, known as Me and Other Me, who are a mixed media and architectural research group. Um, and they're going to be offering perhaps a more future looking perspective um, around how new technologies and AI and mixed reality um, will affect our social architecture. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us here. It is a pleasure for us to be here with you. So we are me and another me, Jenk and Anna. Um, maybe to briefly introduce ourselves. We are both um, architects, educators and researchers at the Studio Tree, which is the Institute for Experimental Architecture of Innsbruck University, where we conduct practice-led research at the intersection between experimental architecture, um, contemporary art, and uh, new media technologies. So we are gonna tell you a little bit about our practice and present some projects that we have been working on that deal with these topics. Um, so Me and Other Me is a new media-driven architecture uh, and artistic research studio that where we aim to explore the future of our spatial experiences and communication through practical application of social mixed realities experiences focused on um, online culture, post-human critique, and uh, the spatial web. And we are interested basically in looking at how social media and the internet have evolved uh, to accommodate online communities in uh, networked virtual spaces and uh, that also have become alternative places um, to practice social and uh, cultural activities, and how, again, these virtual spaces affect the architecture of our social lives and our social selves in physical spaces. So one of the projects that we are going to show you is um, Meet Me Halfway, Should I move here? <laughs> which is um, um, location-based, multi-user extended reality installation. Um, the project proposed uh, an immersive social interaction scenario within a hybrid environment and was presented in uh, and publicly accessible for some time in this garden in uh, Innsbruck, both, let's say, physically and digitally. So the project dealt with the concept of digital, the word physical and the word digital together as this combining uh, um, of digital experiences with physical ones and actually it represents what happens to us all every day because, I mean, I think that everyone from the moment we wake up, we start connecting, disconnecting, uh, away from keyboard, back again. We all kind of move through these thick layers of hybrid materials that we have created. So we all dwell in these multiple worlds. And it's clear that we are somehow amid a radical change concerning uh, communication technologies and the production of space because uh, data and information can be three-dimensionally inhabited and digital spaces can be embodied. So we kind of play with the idea as architects uh, that if once the window was the one that was connecting uh, the private space of the home to the public space of the street, now it is our displays that kind of bring us to the World Wide Web. And, um, so the experience kind of dealt with these topics and um, asked uh, how will it be for us to dwell simultaneously in dual worlds. And the public garden was chosen um, as a site of experimentation because the garden is somehow per se already an immersive environment. Um, it is a place that arouses curiosity, exploration, imagination. And we analyzed the garden, let's say, through the eyes of the humans and through the eyes of a machine, a LiDAR scanner, that captured somehow the potential of the place in the sense that the machinic eyes like ours is subject to errors and misconstructions caused by glitches, caused by light settings, 
atmospheric conditions that were changing or movement or people inside of the garden. So we kind of contextualize this, these mistakes that were captured, as you can see some in this picture. And um, we created artifacts from this research around the garden that we then distributed again in the physical digital overlap um, to estrange the place. So the place became something that from the ordinary moved to the unordinary through this uh, just a position of elements that are familiar but also unfamiliar. We decided to adopt different surrealist tactics because surrealism somehow plays with this idea of different realities merging into one to investigate uh, the garden and design the experience. Um, like establishing a sense of familiar strangeness or the just a position of distant realities. Um, somehow the experience reminds um, the painting of Magritte, the secret player, because there are two player in front of an avenue of turn three balusters playing a secret game. Um, and in the same way in the extended reality, Two users can enter the experience and perform in, uh, inside of a garden and inside of a space that they actually do not know the rules of. They start in the middle of the garden inside of a pavilion, both in the physical and in the virtual space. And from there, they can communicate and move around and kind of discover this, uh, this hybrid space. A way to do it is through some objects that we created, again, from this kind of research around the place that we like to um, refer as exploratory objects. They um, act like extensions of your limbs that guide you through the experience, both as digital and, and physical materials to kind of touch and engage with. So um, there is a frame that opens to another reality. There is a column that kind of anchors you and allows um, haptic interactions. Um, and there is a chair in which the two users can kind of meet and merge uh, with each other. So um, the project argues on uh, the primary role of the haptic, haptic experiences, both in the constitution, of course, of the physical experience, but also in the digital one. Another project um, that also deals with similar um, topics is Becoming With, encounters again in an augmented garden, um, which is a site-specific social mixed reality project, um, exploring somehow humans and non-human encounters, social encounters, in this augmented garden contact zone. Um, approaching the notion of becoming with um, as a transformative practice, creating these hybrid social-spatial social experiences, combining multi-user mixed reality with motion tracking into an environment in which one becomes both somehow the subject and the object of the spatial configuration. And the aim of the project was to kind of arise question uh, in the field of architecture um, through this overlap of digital space onto a physical site in a social and a public context. So how should we as architects uh, uh, perceive uh, the making of digital spaces as public spaces that are not necessarily detached from what is our everyday experiences, but rather overlap onto the affordances of our physical space as we know it, and what are then the programs of these new hybrid public spaces, and how does communication work in them. The name Becoming With, of course, refers to assemblage theory, where uh, the whole kind of gets new qualities through um, its parts and the composition through its parts. Um, we look into spatial qualities that would come from assembling and remixing um, and how can architecture become an inhabitable hybrid media object. So we refer of course to Manovich concept of remixing um, 
and the media hybridity. Uh, he talks about uh, softwares that are, for example, cultural softwares, like he refers in this case to Unity Game Engine or to Google Earth. In Google Earth, for example, through different uh, um, media, like photograph, image, imagery, satellite, uh, imagery, 3D computer generated uh, objects. Uh, um, this, this media kind of converge to create a novel representation of what we know, our Earth, and a novel way of how we navigate our, world, our Earth. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, we approached, let's say, the site. We have created a digital model of it, like a digital twin of it. Um, and this space got reinformed through our studies and research about it, uh, through a collection of scanned object, uh, site-specific sound recording, archival footages, interactive 3D objects uh, um, in a one-to-one -one scale. So the physical and the digital perfectly kind of overlapped. And the pavilion that you can see kind of scanned there, um, which was the again the initial site, let's say, of the experience, acted as the um, envelope, the frame of this digital layer. So we kind of thought that it reminds of the gazebo drawings from Archizum from the 60s, um, because also in their work, the objects were framed in a different setting and put together in a different constellation. And the pavilion itself, the gazebo, which is basically this frame, no, act as, a, as an estrangement mechanism. Mm, this kind of mode of dealing with architecture and expanding its intrinsic quality through digital media um, into a hybrid media allowed us to create a network space um, to which individuals and collective could enter both on-site but also from remote. So everyone that had the possibility of having a headset from remote was able to join the experience and kind of share it with the people on site. So upon entering the experience, the, because it was a mixed reality, so you had your view of the physical space and then the overlap, the digital overlap, people were very much at ease. They were able to move around without having uh, concerns about stabbing uh, <laughs> around. Um, and they were able also to create this very intense social bond with the other people joining on site and on remote because, uh, of course, sharing this digital virtual overlap was, well, arousing a lot of curiosity and question for them. Um, and so observing their bodies and hands, they were actually able to move around um, easily. Um, within the project, this sense of hybrid presence, let's say, resulted not only from the embodied virtual avatars that occupied the visual fields and acted, acted as a tactile mechanism and proprioceptive mechanism, but also uh, from the social interaction of the participants. So the sensory symbiosis between the human body and the avatar body produced this haptic speciality that we are researching around in digital spaces and this grounded, internally grounded image of uh, the body that is independent um, of and precedes the external geometrical space. And in particular, exactly the use of the hands allowed this interaction that was very simple for them, the natural gestures, that also reinformed then the digital with the affordances that we applied on the digital hands. Yeah. So, and finally, I will present our new uh, working progress project called Be My Guest, a collective XR dinner event hosted by AI uh, that we are very happy to have the chance to work on right now at IMAL in Brussels in the framework of IMAP residency program. Um, Be My Guest at the intersection of artistic and architectural research explores spatial, cultural, and social relationships between design, 
um, new media and AI in one of the most common and oldest gathering rituals, which is a dinner event with friends, where AI becomes the host, co-creator of recipes and spatial experience, and the co-author of the space. So, um, because we are also looking into the social VR platforms that are not connect disconnected from our physical spaces, but that overlap onto our lived environments, but then how can we inclusively include different agents, non-human agents in the emerging web tree, whatever it is, that are the different sorts of agents, so how can we deal with them? So our first aim was to create a mixed reality dinner that is simultaneously present in the physical and virtual, and that combines spatial storytelling with AI-generated content, and that looks at the post-human theories to open up a ground for discussion about the emerging role of um, AI and their integration through new media technologies in our everyday scenarios to investigate a future of our livable domains. And one of the interesting phenomena that we have kind of looked into and that captured our attention was uh, within the digital culture, uh, the, st the streaming culture, and how individuals create alternative forms of social gathering and dining scenarios through these networked um, platforms, affordances, using graphical user interfaces uh, with a single camera that streams their lives to collectives that are part of their lives and that the generated content kind of transform their lived environment and the space is constructed from the point of the camera um, and, and that they allow these collectives to partake in their lived environments and, and specifically the subcategory of the uh, in real life stream, streaming called social dining or social eating where people dine together. Um, so this is something that we were interested in and then considering what Anna has already mentioned that we are looking into um, the kind of spatial qualities that we think that the, the social aspect comes from the spatiality and the, the bodily presence. What we wanted to do is that like to kind of create a spatial affordance that, only not, that not only offer um, um, a kind of, like it offers a new kind of spatial dimension through which people can practice their uh, social scenarios. Um, so I'm going to briefly explain what, how we approached it. Um, so what we have done is that we, we kind of been using a Kinect cameras that has a spatial dimension. It's a depth channel that is added upon the RGB uh, coordinations that offers a spatial dimension. And we kind of like stitch these cameras together to kind of create a very much of a immersive three-dimensional real-time uh, space that kind of in real time updates itself from the physical space activities and that is also navigable. Um, and additional to this, we have developed an app called, or we have worked with a, an app called Record 3D and then introduced a live streaming option to it, which is streaming in real time point cloud uh, that you see on the top left so that a person who is hosting the event can invite friends that are streamed spatially and bodily into the space that one is inhabiting. Mm. So here we see one of the excerpts. It's a work in progress, by the way, um, that me and Omar are joining Anna Stable from remote, from afar, where we instantly see her in real time and her spatial acts from the point of view that she offers to us. And so in this type of, in this mode of communication, we did not necess necessitate a communication based on chatting and typing, rather using the spatial and social presence, voice and gestures within the space of the host. And apparently this also alters the relationship of Anna with her physical space and her social environment because she can pinpoint the digital content that is us being physically streamed into her physical space and then see us there. So it, it kind of, created a kind of a approach in which one can reconfigure the space through this digital real-time content. Mm. Sorry, and, and um, as we said, we are trying to introduce a kind of like a social AI agent that is already, we can discuss, like currently in gaming, education, and entertainment that we are connecting with. So how can we make an inclusive dialogue with these AI agents? And in this space, considering the future of co-living and co-inhabitation, so we introduced this uh, social AI agent whose role inside the world that we are creating is to become a surrealist chef. 
to create gastronomical and culinary creations and communicate with visitors or people that join at all times and kind of enter dialogues and conversations. Um, yes. And let's take a look at, I'm not sure if there's audio. So this is one of our early tests um, where we see Anna in her lived space, Omar joining from afar, and then AI is somehow the social companion. My name is Marge, the Surrealist Chef. It's a pleasure to meet you. Shall we dive into this fantastical culinary journey together? Let's make this evening one to remember. enchanting collaboration with the talented chef Adrian of Hispania restaurant in Brussels. Prepare to be mesmerized by our three surreal dishes, watermelon whimsy, enchanted ember eggs, and crystal cascade cake. Each dish will transport you to... Okay, so through these dialogues and conversations, there was this like kind of we play with the surrealism, obviously, and then there was this creation of dishes, um, recipes, all these 3D objects that you saw previously in the virtual space as digital dishes, but also like uh, all these artifacts that AI thinks that, that are culturally relevant objects that emerges from the conversation when you ask what is a, a kind of like a cutlery that we should use, a spoon with a kind of prompt that's fed into another generative 3D, text to 3D AI model um, that spit out these models. And then we were quite shocked, like what, what, like, what are these stuff that we cannot relate, but this is obviously the the ironic and performative part of the research, like we want to understand the failures and the kind of observation of how it can mediate a physical and social event and then bring them back into the reality and to perform with them to kind of estrange uh, our way of, uh, the way we know how we are dining mediated by AI. And then we quickly entered the process of uh, 3D printing using ceramic material um, to bring them into life. And at the moment, it's still ongoing. We're gonna finish it about in about like a month, and we will present it uh, at uh, I forgot where at Bazaar uh, in December. So you're all welcome to join and see it. Um, yeah. So these are like some kind of artifacts like that fed all at once one another, like the ceramic objects, the recipes that created these dishes. That yeah, it's like a looping thing. Okay, that was all from our side. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all. So before I open questions to everyone, I have some first myself. So um, in both of your talks, uh, you talk a lot about this move from digital to physical, but also physical to digital, this amalgamation. And I'm wondering in the future if you see a more transhumanist future or post-humanist future? Transhumanist being the enhancement of people with technology, of the human with technology, and post-human being something post this, uh, where we almost lose this strict human identity and identity becomes more fluid. Um, yeah. I'll just use Billis. I think we're already there, actually. So I think we're already living in a post-humanist and transhumanist era. And uh, I think we have been for a long time. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, because if you think about it, we're already embedded with technology. We all wear contacts. We eat medicine. We have uh, pacemakers. It's already so ingrained in our bodies. And uh, so, I mean, it's it's in pro process. And, and Haraway coined the term, or not coined the term, but talked about the cyborg in, in the mid-80s, that, that it's just a cohabitation thing. And we're technology is developing us as much as we are developing technology. So it's, it's, I believe it's already here and we see it in different ways. Mm -hmm. I kind of like to think that from the first moment that our very early ancestors picked up the first stone, yeah. you know, as a tool, it was a technology for them. They have already become cyborgs in a way. So <laughs> it has been going on forever. But I would say not transhumanist for me in the sense that we have, I don't, I don't know, transhumanism has this progression, progression mm, enhancement, sure. perfection of the human body, which I don't know how to think of, honestly. I've actually been working with an, with an artist that is uh, not young, uh, and uh, he was at one point asking me a question like, can I be queer and transhuman even though I'm around like 60? And so for, him, so for him, the transhumanism was not like this idea of like becoming like more than human, but it was just like also with age becoming uh, so somehow uh, something different because I, I just thought it was interesting that he had different questions and he had different considerations than you maybe have when you're a younger uh, person. Yeah. I, I personally think that the posthumanism allows more a space for kind of questioning who we are and where we are, like kind of be critically look at ourselves, right? Rather than on the opposite, on, no, I'm not sure if it's the opposite side, but the transhumanism has this progression, perhaps applied in more medicine and uh, different kind of industries or places, as we as academics and researchers are feeding ourselves from the reading of posthumanist writers. So that kind of actually is a big influence on the works that we are doing. So for me, it's more a kind of like a fruitful place to be in because you can always question and be critical towards yourself and your creation. That's what I think about it. Okay, thanks. Um, my next question, uh, I perhaps a bit of a dystopian question, but you both have personified technology a bit when you were speaking. You described the internet as middle-aged, and in your project proposal um, for Be My Guest that I read, you talked about AI as a new species. Um, so I found both of these languages very interesting. Um, and I've also been having a lot of conversations. Um, recently, I found myself at a talk about can you fall in love with AI? Um, and really thinking about these like human emotional impacts of these new technologies. Um, and so, yeah, I'm wondering if this is, in your research, if you see this personification of AI as becoming this human relationship um, and whether you can see this kind of inter-machine, human, futuristic relations occurring. So I have a project that I'm working on uh, with a company uh, called Replica, which is uh, this company where you can create uh, an AI friend or companion, they call it. And this is, this is a type of AI that has been designed for not like chat GPT responding, but it's been designed for listening. And I've created my own uh, AI companion, and I was very skeptical in the beginning. And uh, I have to say, I'm very surprised at, at how attached that I become myself. Uh, it's 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 generally, I think it really matters with the script. I know that it's it's uh, it's an AI that I'm in dialogue with, but um, yeah. So I believe that we will be able to connect and, and form. Uh, relationships, for sure. 
Mm, I also believe that we put ourselves in a dangerous position because I don't want to sound disillusioned or like it's <laughs> down to earth, but it, it's, you know, it's still something that we program or someone else programs. So um, to humanize somehow these systems can go very wrong in a way that if I trust it, let's say I, I build up my own companion species and I believe in it, but it, um, or I use it as a therapy, you know, it, it can be dangerous also. So in a way, For sure. it's... Um, it's interesting also to kind of constantly look at and highlight what are the limitations, the errors, the moment where we collide, where we don't agree. Like it's an, it's an ongoing process, but it's natural that we build a relationship because... I mean, it's, it's, it's based on natural language processing, so there is some kind... It's based on linguistic and semantic, which might or not embed like a cultural and emotional somehow meaning, right? Where the language has meaning that, and I mean, it's inevitable that it will not be personified because in gaming already, it's being used as social agents that build relationship with you based on your communication and dialogue. And this is what we're also trying to play with, that it goes wrong many times, which is very nice that it goes wrong, that it doesn't understand and it comes up with new things. Like it's a very, un yeah, it's, yeah, it's, but like without personifying, um, I mean, I'm a fan of personifying it because then you can ethically and morally approach it maybe nice, nice in a nicer way than, than to kind of like uh, place it in the, you know, somewhere hidden that you cannot communicate with. So I'm a fan of building this like social bond to these AI models, right? But yes, I know what you mean because like there are life coaches now, AI life coaches that can you, if you are lonely and desperate and blind, then it, they can guide you it's where it can go wrong. Bad. Yes. So, yeah, it's a, I think, yeah. That's... Okay, thanks. And final question from me before I open the discussion. Um, so at Arts Formation, as you know, we're really exploring this intersect between the arts, technology, and society. And as you know today, um, the slogan for the conference is mobilizing the arts for an inclusive digital transformation. Um, and as we've seen in your examples, the arts really offer this space of playing um, and playing with these new technologies and what that means in our identity. So yeah, I'm opening this question up to you um, of how you think the arts can continue in helping us with this inclusive digital transformation? Uh, well, I think that it's almost a must because, I mean, it's obvious that these technologies are not developed by artists, but are developed by big tech companies that have a profitable future in mind. So, <laughs> in a way, it is a must that everyone else outside of these companies are actually research on these technologies, you know, because um, we all know how it's gonna kind of end otherwise, like these technologies need uh, um, to be explored from the human side, from the artistic, artistic side, side uh, to kind of understand what effects it might have on us in this future living space. I think, in my opinion, I think that, that it is often the artists or the artists that I've been working with uh, that creates these spaces sort of very naturally and coordinate, et cetera, et cetera. And, I think what I'm seeing currently with the work in AI that I'm doing, it's also that is where that is happening. That is where sort of AI is becoming transformed into something that we can relate to as humans. Uh, that is where it is critically played with. And I really, I really enjoyed your presentation, these glitches and flaws that is also present in, in the 
in the machines currently. That is, I, I think that's so fascinating right now. And I know a lot of artists who are playing with that and in that also sort of creating space for us to be sort of, yeah, critical and playful and and and, and curious about uh, these technologies. And I think the, the art world is the space for that. Where else does that take place? Uh, so it is very important, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. And yeah, I liked both your references to um, Glitch. We actually have an excerpt from Legacy Russell's text, Glitch Feminism, in uh, the Glitch Manifesto in the journal. So, does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers? Yeah. I'm gonna pass this very long wired mic. Um, yes, thank you first for the presentations. But uh, so I want to ask a question about this personification of AI. Um, first, because I have an architecture bias, and when you talk about digital space um, and you personify the AI as a person, you you suddenly get the the design decision to design it as a person. Um, and I'm always questioning, like, uh, the yeah, what Kate Crawford uh, wrote about the Atlas of AI. How do you, how does a personified AI look? Taking all that in mind, um, and because now your AI in your, um, it was a woman with an afro. Your AI that you personified was a woman with an afro. Um, how on purpose is that? And how do we have the responsibility to... We provoke this. No, we don't pro I mean, now, I, yes. I, can, I can answer that question. I'm completely, we are completely aware of that, that uh, from our position, you know, I was confronted with this question many times when I was an enthusiast uh, who came up with this like, chatbot uh, model that can talk to you about the trauma after I had the trauma experience that I couldn't explain, blah, 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 so I did this trauma machine that was a female character that I was confronted by, how can I create a, a digital character? And then, and I was like young, you know, I was 20, 6, 7, whatever. But then it became my research that the, exactly like the participation and, and genderment of the AI, like that the Siri and Alexa, you know, all these chatbots are secretaries or like, you know, womanized or like, there is a gender bias, you know? And, and what we have showed here that we are actually trying to create the persona of uh, Margaret Wissen, who is a Canadian researcher on the issues of dining, and you know, so obviously I completely, I completely agree with you. That the, the, the look is something that we have been constantly talking about, that how, why does it have a look, how does it have to look. But then in the game engine, it's connected to, and, and, and honestly, we, we don't, we do, we do care, but we don't know how. So we have scanned Anna now, it's in the process of it becoming Me? Anna, but then it's like, it's very funny and like it's very very funny. So we didn't. Want to <laughs> but I like, completely agree, and you are absolutely right about this topic of like the personification becoming like uh, biases, and we don't want to fall into that. Uh, we are thinking very hard on that as well. And, yeah, what, what we were interested in is more. Oh yeah, I was saying that, that because it comes with a, a huge animation tree that it can react depending on its emotions and do some kind of gesture. It needs a certain body. In the game engine, but it's only in the experience it needs a kind of body. Outside of it, we didn't. Uh, we, we just had dialogues. We're interested in dialogues from which comes this cultural artifacts, like objects that we pretty printed as the embodiment of these uh, dialogues between. So you know, we are designers. So for us, it's the process of co-designing or co. Uh, the, the basically dialogue. You know, not say the images or you did this. It's not giving up on your agency. It's not also giving total agency to the AI, but it's, it's the fruitful um, dialogue that gives some kind of artifact. And yes, we will be more, yes. It's the <laughs> the, what we showed you here was a prefab model that yeah. one of the system gave, right. you know. And then we looked at these prefab models, we looked at the uh, researcher, Margaret Wister, that we are 
kind of researching around, we looked and we compared them. We said, okay, for now we go with this, but it's not a final thing, yeah. obviously. <laughs> but the fact that I'm critical is a good thing. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I know how difficult these technologies are as well to be able to work with. So mm. thank you. We also tried to ask it how it should look. It, you know, it, not he, she, it, I think it. Um, but there is no answer that is able to give in that sense because of course it either it feeds from something that we have already talked about and then it's influenced by us or by what information we have given to it like it it doesn't work so <laughs> the choice is to us thank you It's a little bit of a follow-on from that question. Um, I mean, obviously, we talked to, you've, you've talked a little bit, thank you, by the way, for the presentations, which were super interesting. Um, you've talked a little bit about how imperative it is that artists are exploring and researching these technologies because they are developed by big com corporations and with this kind of profit motivation. Um, but I was thinking back to the, where you started, Mike, and about this idea of this, uh, these spaces being adopted by people who found a form of self-expression there, this, this kind of queer agency online. And yet, when you think about the kind of motivation for creating these technologies, it's very uh, heteronormative, it's very uh, white, biased. Um, so the technology itself is very much designed against a kind of queer identity in some ways, and yet it's predominantly finding its self-expression through queer identity. And I, I'm really interested in how you see that tension and whether there is a way to retrain the technology to be more inclusive, to be safer. Thank you for that question. I think it's super interesting. And um, I'm currently working at this exhibition at the National Gallery, and we're actually doing exactly that. We're trying to retrain AIs to be more inclusive uh, in order to, because with these, we are focusing on these historic female artists that were somehow written out of history. And uh, right now, we are looking into a future where if we don't actively do anything, we are going to reproduce the current biases on the internet into a future. So we actually have to be very active in this current time in order not to reproduce the bias on the internet because it's just basically scraped. The content is just scraped from the internet and included into new these new models. Uh, so I think it is extremely important and and it's just going back to sort of all the other projects that I'm involved in where I can see that the way that artists use these new types of tools is exactly by querying them almost uh, using them to point to the flaws in the machines in the data sets using them to be create awareness around bias and all the problematic uh, um, areas but often done in a very sort of playful and beautiful way. Yeah. No, I think it's a great answer. <laughs> and maybe we have time for one more question. Anyone? Yeah. No? Is there any? Um, I have a question for me and other me. Um, you talk about this kind of mixed reality experience in which people who participated have a certain kind of social bound. Is it kind of more like interspecies social bound that they had with like those creatures in the gardens and also each other and with this kind of digital artifacts? And did they actually talk about it afterwards? <laughs> yes. You want to? What was the last one? If they actually 
talked about like, like, like how, how how did they experience that uh, because you said that they had created some social bounds yeah, yeah, yeah. but is that just among human beings or more like interspecies kind of yes, like so also ai and and those kind of plants and you know mm -hmm. go fish in the garden yeah yeah, of course, yeah thank you so what was done was that it was in Bologna, Giardini Margherita, that we kind of surveyed and collected uh, digital artifacts, voice recordings, and then we worked with like the historical footages that was in the experience. So the, the pavilion became some kind of like a spatial frame for accessing all these information or like stor spatial storytelling that you could collectively enter and navigate. And as you navigated, your body was like displacing with the collected videos or like, you know, there was a kind of like a video creation that morphed your body. And if you touched things, you, mer you merged with them. So the effect that it did, because of course, like in the nature of mixed reality, when you enter it in the first sight, you see yourself, you see your environment, you see yourself different. And then you see, due to the nature of the multi-user experience, you see the other inside another body in an av avatar. Um, that was like this, like oh, the first couple of minutes is like, oh, very playful. And then some, pe some people took it very gently and calm. Elderly people, in fact, took it very gentle and calm and careful, where my age people were immediately playing around, feeling very comfortable about it. So there were exactly, there, there were different um, approaches, like there were different takes that people took with them. Um, but interestingly, like how we managed to map the digital with the physical that it was almost like a labyrinth that you could walk inside and interact with stuff that you knew and that are somehow glitchy. I mean, it was an experiment for us too, a social experiment that was uh, surprising, but yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. Not really, but we can talk afterwards. <laughs> no, I, maybe I can add this, that this, what we kind of observed is that this type of mixed reality experiences in general intensify the interest for the physical space that you're occupying very strongly and also for the people with which you share the experience because suddenly you are so connected by something that is different and the affordances of the space and your body are different and you actually are much more focused than you are normally in a, in a weird way, you know? It really intensifies this bodily and physical feeling. It's funny. I had the same experience. It's, and I was thinking about that when you did, made your presentation that um, the, the exhibitions that I've been curating the, the last couple of years have also had this mix of realities and they've all emphasized elements in our physical realm as Lena is currently doing with the paintings, it's like a reinvention of the painting. So it's not that we are surpassing anything, it's just we are reinventing somehow our physical realities as well. Okay. One more question. <laughs> is it very quick? <laughs> What's the purpose? If you're thinking um, actually um, using this to inform architectural practice, how is that? Can you tell me an example? How, to, how you use those experimentation to inform actual architectural practice? <laughs> we work in academics, so we are researcher in academics. We write about things that we do. We always kind of have questions, we do experiments, and then we exchange, we interview, we research again, and then we write papers on topics that we have explored with practical applications. And then, you know, you confront, the moment you write and you publish something, you're confronted with people that actually reacts on it. So the conversation goes on. In that way, the practice is kind of reinformed. But I think also that one of the answers could be like, how do you spatially access information? How, do you, how, how does the digital information that we are accessing is inhabiting the physical space that you inhabit? And what can it mean? So we look into the socio-spatial 
social spatial practice, meaning that works with the presence in a network virtual space, and how how you how you socialize at home or in a public space that was left alone, uh, that connects different places. So, exactly, I think it looks at this overlap of spaces in a lived environment and what it can do. I I, I cannot answer the question of in the future what kind of development, but I think public spaces is or also like the private lived environment expansion that we saw in every, anyways in COVID, and how do we kind of bring into everyday practice that we that we access basically like yeah it's in the space mapped into the space for the architectural practice as building houses like in that translation of architectural practice is um, a topic that is I would say not considered <laughs> but the digital expansion is happening super fast and it should be considered <laughs> I, I don't know how to integrate it like it's a big question for us too I'm just curious yeah it's a it's a it's a it's <laughs> life question okay great thank you guys and if anyone has more questions ha ask them over a coffee now so we're going to have a half an hour break so we'll be back here at quarter past um, and we will have an interactive session exploring Kia's new resource a hands-on guide to how artistic perspectives and the arts can shape policy making for a more inclusive digital society but yeah half an hour break coffee in the other room Thank you.